Assalamu alaikum students welcome back to class I'm sure um, you're very happy that we're coming to the close of this semester and this is your American literature class and the code of course is ENG 552 we've done a number of things in this class and I keep on reminding you how we have done essays and we've done short stories um, and of course poems and currently what we're doing is the play The Glass Menagerie by Tennessee Williams. Tennessee Williams is one of the most famous contemporary American uh, dramatists and that is one reason why I included uh, The Glass Menagerie in your um, syllabus. We uh, have done uh, quite a bit of the play and you know by now that there are four characters in this play. There's Mrs. Wingfield, um, her children Tom Wingfield and Laura Wingfield, uh, and a fourth character who comes towards the end of the play and who is only identified as the gentleman caller. Later on, of course, we um, find out that his name is uh, James Delany uh, O'Connor and that he is an Irishman. Um, there is a fifth character who doesn't actually appear uh, and yet he is there all the time and that is the character of Mr. Wingfield. Now Mr. Wingfield doesn't appear in person but there's a portrait of him uh, hanging on one of the walls. The stage is set in such a way that we see more than one room. We see the dining room, we also see the living room and we know that there's a door that goes into um, the kitchenette and um, it's a small apartment um, the uh, the environment is that of uh, the lower middle class and uh, the apartment is at the rear of the building showing you that it is one of the cheaper apartments in fact it is probably the cheapest that the wing fields could find um, they have a lot of issues chiefly amongst them is the issue that Mr. Wingfield uh, was uh, the wandering kind or not really the kind who would um, take care of his family so he just gets up one day and he disappears from the scene and all that we see of him is this portrait that's hanging on the wall and which hangs throughout the play um, another thing that differentiates this play from other plays is the fact that the narrator, <coughs> Tom Wingfield, is also a character in the play. He is the son of Mrs. Amanda Wingfield and he's also the sort of omniscient narrator. It's basically a memory play in the sense that we are um, we're seeing everything from Tom Wingfield's uh, perspective because he's the narrator so we see everything from his point of view. Um, he is relating all the incidents that take place. He uh, describes to us each character, he describes the scene to us and he also gives us the background to the story. So for example he tells us that his father has been gone for 16 years now. 16 years is a very long time and during that time all that they received from him was one postcard which showed that he was alive and it had just two words on it, hello, goodbye. And after that or before that there's been absolutely no communication. The point at which I left off was uh, where um, after Amanda Wingfield's insistence Tom Wingfield brings home one of his colleagues uh, who is not married and the idea is for him to be sort of trapped in such a way that uh, he will marry Laura Wingfield because what is uppermost in Mrs. Ming Mrs. Wingfield's mind right now is that she should get Laura married off. She's tried to um, enroll her in a secretarial school so that uh, Laura can support herself financially but she finds out that Laura runs away from school 
and in spite of the fact that uh, Mrs. Wingfield has um, paid a hefty sum as tuition money, Laura does not go back to school and she says, I cannot go back to school because I feel so humiliated. I cannot learn anything. So when Mrs. Wingfield um, realizes that Laura cannot um, earn her own living, she um, develops this idea of getting her married off um, and um, this this idea becomes an obsession with her partly because she claims to have had uh, a lot of uh, young men who were willing to marry her when she was young and so she expects the same thing for her daughter but that cannot be so because for one thing Laura is not as pretty as Amanda Wingfield was um, at her age for another thing Laura is already slightly past the age uh, where girls get got married at that particular time remember um, Williams is talking uh, about the first half of the 20th century um, and so that's almost a hundred years removed from uh, where we are today and what was required of girls at that time was to dress up very prettily to be able to uh, have conversations uh, and that was it this was um, the requirement in um, high society uh, from where Amanda Wingfield claims to have uh, originated she claims that uh, she came from a very established family uh, and that is why um, she worries so much and uh, she becomes so obsessed with money so oh, so that all the time um, these thoughts are running through her mind and she thinks of how they can save how they can make more money uh, and um, in added to that is the fact that um, she feels that if she can get Laura married off it can only be to one of Tom's colleagues because Laura doesn't go out anywhere remember Laura has a, a disability Laura herself calls uh, herself a cripple but Mrs. Wingfield will not allow her to use that word she says you have a disability the fact of the matter is that Laura limps Laura cannot walk straight plus she is involved with these glass animals she has this bowl of glass animals and uh, she spends her time washing them and polishing them and drawing them uh, or playing old records on the Victrola so there are only um, sort of two things in life that interest her um, taking care or uh, polishing her animals glass animals and uh, playing the Victrola she's not really interested in anything else and according to Tom this limits her um, capacity to attract people from the other sex because she doesn't go out anywhere uh, she doesn't meet people she's very shy and she um, becomes particularly shy when she realizes that the the gentleman caller who is coming um, to her house with Tom and who is a colleague of Tom's is none other than the Jim O'Connor with whom she had fallen in love during her school days at that time um, Jim O'Connor had been uh, on the basketball team he had been in the glee club he was a singer um, he was in short the high school hero so when she realizes that this same um, young man is coming to her house she gets very nervous and very tense and her nervousness um, and uh, tension are shown when she is instructed by her mother to go and open the door and she says I won't I feel sick do you realize that this is the same man that I told you I was in love with and I cannot open the door so Mrs. Wingfield becomes very angry and she says you have to go and open the door and I'm not going to take this nonsense anymore um, and um, so she goes she opens the door but then as soon as um, Tom and his uh, colleague come in 
Laura mumbles something about uh, playing the Victrola and um, she leaves the presence of the two gentlemen. So when she does that, um, the two men start discussing things and because they're working in the same place, it's automatic for them to be discussing uh, problems and issues related with the workplace. And um, this is the time when Jim O'Connor tells um, Tom that the administration is not happy with him uh, because he has been taking time out to do other things and that if Tom is not careful he might be fired any day. Tom then confesses that he's not afraid of being fired. He says, in fact, I am going to leave this job because what I have in mind is something totally different. I am a member of um, the uh, Merchant Seamen Society and uh, I intend to, um, to join a ship and not come back here. So I'm um, going ahead of uh, what we have done. We wound up uh, at a point in time where uh, Jim O'Connor has just been told that uh, Tom plans to uh, go away, um, to go on to the seas. And uh, Jim O'Connor wants to know when he's going, uh, to which Tom replies, that he's going soon and we ended at um, a point where Jim O'Connor says where where so he wants to know where exactly um, Tom plans to go but um, the, the the scene fades out at a point uh, where um, they are in the middle of the conversation okay so let's see what we have um, today now, during this conversation that Tom and Jim are having, Tom says, I'm starting to boil inside. I know I seem dreamy. Remember, he's been writing poems on shoeboxes, and Jim O'Connor has given him the nickname of Shakespeare. So um, he says, I may seem dreamy, but I'm boiling inside because I don't want to spend my whole life um, in a shoe warehouse. There are other things I want to do. I want to have adventures. I want to have excitement in my life and uh, neither of these I have um, at the moment. So um, he says that um, I have realized how short life is and what I am doing. So he says whatever I plan to do in life it does not include um, selling shoes. It, it doesn't have anything to do with shoes except uh, shoes as they are um, on a traveler's feet. That is all that um, I need. And he say, and then he um, he finds that paper and he says, "Look at this." And Jim says, "What is this?" And um, Tom says, "I'm a member of the mer merchant, the union of merchant seamen, and um, I have paid my dues." And I'm going to go away very soon because I want to go out onto the seas. And um, he says that I have paid my dues in the sense that I didn't pay the electricity bill, but I paid my uh, monthly dues. And any day I'm going to get a call and then I'll go. And Jim says, what about your mother? And uh, to this Tom says, I am like my father. My father has been gone 16 years. It is time now for me to follow in his footsteps, leave this house, leave my mother and my sister, and go and find something that I want to do, not something that society dictates that I should do or that my family wants me to do. I want to be my own person, and I am going to be my own person. Jim, of course, tries to dissuade him by saying, you know, um, you have no idea what your mother is going to feel like. And Tom says, shh, here comes mother. She doesn't know anything about this. So in other words, what he's saying is, don't breathe a word. Amanda comes in and with Amanda's entrance, both Jim and Tom get a shock. And the shock is that she has dressed herself up in one of those uh, frocks or gowns that she wore as a young girl. 
Now, what is suitable for a young girl in um, in a southern high class party is not suitable for um, a casual evening at home where your guest is the only person and who is a colleague. This is not a formal dinner. This is not a party. This is just one person coming to have dinner with his colleague. He doesn't even realize that he has a family. So um, you notice that Jim O'Connor is totally oblivious to the presence of uh, Laura Wingfield. Laura Wingfield, on the other hand, is very much aware of Jim O'Connor's uh, personality, chiefly because she has recognized Jim. Jim has not recognized Laura, uh, partly because she has changed and also because Jim was never the noticing kind. Um, in, in high school, uh, he was the favorite of the girls and boys. So um, he didn't have to know everyone, but everybody knew about him. So um, Jim says, you know, what, what are you going to do? And uh, Tom says, I have not told this to my mother. So when his mother comes in, she's dressed like a young girl. She's not at all dressed as a middle-aged uh, woman should be. And then she laughs at everything and she giggles. Um, and she behaves more like a young girl than Laura does. Laura appears to be uh, sophisticated, reserved, uh, and she doesn't say a single word. Amanda makes up for it by doing all the talking. And now that she is dressed up in her finery, she says, well, 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 so this is Mr. O'Connor. Introductions entirely unnecessary. Now, this is um, an indication of the fact that whatever they're having is on a very um, informal level. So she, she um, becomes um, a little too much because she keeps on talking to Jim and she, she even flirts with him. Uh, and she says, you know, I've heard so much from Tom. Now that is strictly speaking not true. Tom has not been talking about Jim O'Connor, uh, but that's something that uh, Mrs. Wingfield interprets from Tom's silences uh, and the few words that Tom um, does utter. And uh, one of the things that she says is um, that Tom should open the door because um, she has felt a nice fresh breeze as, um, as she calls it. So she, she, she acts like a little girl, she is dressed like a little girl, but she cannot turn the clock back. No matter how hard she tries, she cannot become the Amanda of um, 30 years ago. So she continues to talk with him and you realize that um, the less that Laura talks, the more does Mrs. Wingfield talk. You know, she's, she, th there's no shutting her up. She talks and she talks and she talks. She embarrasses Tom, she embarrasses Laura, but she doesn't think of that for a moment. For her, what is important is that Jim O'Connor should be trapped in such a way that um, he keeps coming back to the house and ultimately he should marry Laura. That is what she has in mind. How she goes about it is her way of doing things. And her way of doing things is that you need to talk a lot in order to make the other person feel comfortable. So she starts off with uh, the, the rise in the temperature and uh, she goes on to saying light, uh, that we are wearing light clothes because, you know, summer is already around her. Um, the corner and uh, if we don't watch out we're all going to burn up so um, she she becomes very excited uh, and she starts uh, becoming voluble she talks a lot you see that um, Laura when she when she sees Jim O'Connor she just wants to run away Amanda wants to stay there 
and um, somehow or the other entangled um, Jim O'Connor in such a way that he will end up marrying Laura Wingfield. So that is her aim. But the way in which she goes on, the manner in which she um, goes on talking about summer and saying, you know, it's so warm and I need to feel the breeze, open up the door, etc., etc. So um, a little overbearing for Jim and even for uh, her own son. Uh, to the extent that Tom sort of calls her attention to this by saying mother and Amanda says yes honey now she's never addressed him as that but because there's a guest around so she's extra sweet um, and Tom says what about supper and Amanda says you go and ask sister if supper is ready uh, you know that sister is in full charge of supper so she's giving the impression that Laura has made everything whereas that's not so it's Amanda who's been working as Williams calls it like a Turk so uh, Amanda's been working very hard Amanda's been working like a uh, like a slave and yet because she wants um, Jim to be impressed by Laura she says you know Laura has been doing all the cooking and she's in charge of the kitchen so you go and uh, ask her when supper is going to be ready. Meanwhile, I will entertain the guests. So this is all um, how she has maneuvered it um, so that when she is left alone with, uh, with this uh, gentleman caller or uh, Mr. O'Connor, she can get a few details um, out of him. So she starts off by saying, have you met Laura? And um, Jim says, um, yes, she let us in. And Amanda says, oh, let you in. Good. That means you've met already. You know, it's very rare for a sweet and pretty girl to be polite also. So uh, what she is trying to uh, convince Jim O'Connor uh, with is that Laura is beautiful, that Laura is intelligent and uh, that Laura does not have any airs, you know, she's not a snob. Um, in spite of the fact that um, she's living in a big city, she is not a snob. She's very shy, very domesticated, uh, and those are her biggest plus points. Although when they are alone, Mrs. Wingfield tries to uh, tell Laura that um, shyness is no longer counted as something positive so she goes on talking um, and while she is talking to Jim O'Connor she also tries to impress on him uh, her background her upbringing her family very very typical perhaps of um, women in a situation where you come from a very established family and you marry into a family that is not as financially established um, so she says you know I was raised in the south and in the south you have certain traditions uh, and of course we lived on a plantation and I was so sure that I was going to marry the son of a planter who would ultimately be a planter himself uh, and uh, that is what I had thought would uh, I would end up doing but um, and then she sort of uh, plays upon the words a little and she says man proposes and woman uh, accepts the proposal so um, she twists around the saying that man proposes and God disposes um, and she says that woman accepts the proposal and that is how she came to be married to Tom Wingfield's father otherwise what she's trying to say is that she is not uh, as poor as she appears to be she comes from a very financially established um, family it's just that because her husband left them without any notice at all um, they are not really well off now and they only have Tom's income coming in and um, that is it so she says I married no planter I married a man who worked for the telephone company that gallantly smiling gentleman over there so you know she's been cursing him previously but now she says 
that he is um, smiling gallantly you know he is uh, one of those who uh, one of those wonderful wonderful people and she says now he travels he was a telephone man now he travels and I don't even know where he is so she's making light of it um, and she's not emphasizing the fact that um, this causes her a lot of pain so she says what am I doing you know these are my problems and tell me your problems what do you do and I hope you don't have any uh, problem so she she goes off the track and she says uh, I want to know more about you um, and uh, when she calls out to Tom she says is supper nearly ready and Tom says it's looked it looks to me like supper is on the table so she's just sort of sent Tom out of the room for a bit in order to give Jim O'Connor her background and to sort of justify herself um, to Jim O'Connor in the sense that she has not always been this poor it's the Wingfields who are poor uh, but she Amanda comes from uh, of a very established um, family so when Tom says that uh, supper appears to me to be ready Amanda says let me take a look and um, and then she sees that Laura is missing and she says where is sister to which Tom says Laura is not feeling well and she says that she needs to be excused from the table now Laura has gone into hiding but Amanda will not let her stay there so um, she says you know it is rude and um, it is uh, dishonorable to absent yourself from the dining table when you have a guest so she calls out to Laura and Laura with a very faint voice says yes mother and Amanda says you have to come to the table we won't be seated until you come to the table now this is very significant because earlier on she had said more or less the same thing um, about uh, about Tom Wingfield at the very beginning of the play she's she sees that Tom is missing and she says Tom you have to come to the table because we will not say grace until you come to the table in other words um, she will um, she uh, will not start the meal until all members of um, the family are present so she makes Mr. O'Connor sit in a particular place and she calls out to um, Laura and um, Laura doesn't want to respond and and so Mrs. Uh, Wingfield because she's still in the presence of a guest she uses very polite language and she says you keeping us waiting honey we can't say grace until you come to the table if Mr. Wing if if Jim O'Connor had not been there probably Mrs. Wingfield would have shouted the place down uh, for Laura but as things are there's a guest in the house they cannot afford to offend that guest um, and so uh, Laura does not get the thrashing that according to uh, Mrs. Wingfield she actually deserves so Amanda Wingfield calls out to everyone everyone moves towards the table and the legend on the screen displays terror because uh, Laura Wingfield starts to move very slowly towards the dining room outside a summer storm is coming abruptly the white curtains billow inward at the windows and there is a sorrowful murmur and deep blue dusk so it is the time between evening and uh, night it's a beautiful time of the year it's a beautiful time of the day there is absolute silence because everyone who is working has gone home um, and Laura enters uh, the room she stumbles slightly because she's trying to walk as straight as possible um, and when she stumbles she get, gets hold of um, the chair of um, the, the, the chair frame and she prevents um, herself from falling down 
Amanda is concerned um, and uh, Laura is very very tense because all her dreams have been realized the man that she has dreamed about all these years is in her uh, house and yet she cannot do anything about it because she's neither beautiful nor super intelligent so uh, when she stumbles a bit um, Amanda gets uh, Tom Wingfield to take her to the next room and um, to stay with her until um, the others have uh, finished their meal and the excuse that she gives for Laura uh, falling down and Laura feeling um, nauseous is that she's been standing close to the stove you know the impression that she's trying to give out is that whatever has been made here has been made with Laura's help and not as the story actually goes and that is that nobody but nobody helped her uh, and that um, it's something that uh, she has done on her own so Laura is taken by Tom Wingfield to lie down on the sofa and Amanda and Jim O'Connor continue their uh, conversation she says grace uh, and then you, um, you you start eating whatever it is uh, that um, they've not had the opportunity to uh, so she says grace they start eating and um, Amanda um, just t steals a look at Jim meanwhile in the living room Laura is stretched out um, she is lying on um, the sofa and her tension knows no bounds because she has been able to avoid him at the dinner table uh, but how long can she go on doing that with this the scene dims out and we go on to scene 7 which is half an hour later it is titled a souvenir and um, when the scene opens we see dinner just being finished uh, in the area which is concealed by the drawn curtains you know um, you can see uh, beyond the curtain but you can only see outlines so a meal is not actually shown being consumed uh, but the um, the curtain rises and the curtain falls and rises uh, and the scene that is shown is that of half an hour later when dinner has been consumed as the curtain rises Laura is still huddled upon the sofa remember she had been carried to the sofa so that she could lie down um, her feet are drawn under her her head resting on a pale blue pillow her eyes wide and mysteriously watchful so a very romantic figure um, Williams has created here uh, for uh, Laura Wingfield uh, the new floor lamp with its shade of rose colored uh, silk gives a soft becoming light to her face so La the, the scene is set for Laura to appear at her best she's wearing a very pretty dress um, she has nice features but because there uh, because there's a lack of personality a lack of strength in her personality she um, does not appear to be beautiful in the same way that for example Amanda Wingfield does Amanda has a lot of confidence Laura lacks confidence and it's confidence that contributes to um, uh, Amanda Wingfield's uh, beauty and which detracts from uh, Laura Wingfield's beauty but the moment that we find when um, scene 7 uh, on scene 7 the curtain rises is um, Laura appearing um, at her best with this very soft light um, and um, there's a murmur of rain falling so everything is very soft and cozy and sweet and that's the kind of background that Laura needs um, in order to appear um, at her best so in the instructions that um, Williams um, gives as stage directions um, he says that the moon breaks out and there is this soft 
uh, light falling from the moon and it it makes the entire scene very very beautiful and very very uh, romantic so um, Jim calls out to uh, Tom Wingfield and says hey there mr. light bulb and um, the the fact is that um, the um, there, there is no light it's getting dark and uh, Jim calls out to Tom because he wants him to provide some form of light and um, Amanda takes this opportunity to crack a joke and she says where was Moses when the lights went out uh, do you know the answer to that Mr. O'Connor and Jim is very polite he keeps on calling her madam all the time and he says no ma'am I don't know the answer and Amanda says you know he was in the dark so um, she laughs at that and, and, and Jim laughs appreciatively although it's probably a joke that um, Jim O'Connor has heard about a million times already but because he is a guest um, and he doesn't want to offend his hostess so he laughs at whatever she says and he shares um, everything that she has to share uh, what uh, what you feel when you are watching this play or when you're reading this play is that Amanda is going slightly overboard she doesn't have to be that chatty uh, but to give the devil his due she is making up for uh, the deficiencies of Laura whatever Laura does not do Amanda wants to fill in that gap so that Jim O'Connor doesn't feel that there is something lacking in the house. So she says, you know, it doesn't make any difference if there's no electricity, I'm going to light the candles and she's already placed candles on the table uh, and she says, which of you gentlemen can provide a match? So Jim O'Connor has uh, a match uh, box and um, so they light the candles and um, Amanda um, you know tries to cover up the situation um, where the lights have gone out and she says I guess the fuse has burnt out Mr. O'Connor can you tell a burnt out fuse I know I can't and Tom is a total loss when it comes to mechanics so she's trying to uh, provide an opportunity for Jim O'Connor um, to show that he can do something she claims not to know anything about fuses although that's strictly speaking not true she's a very practical woman and chances are that um, she can uh, fix a burnt out fuse herself but she calls upon um, Jim O'Connor because this uh, this is like a godsend opportunity if he's mechanically minded she will know already and if he's not even then she knows uh, what to expect so um, Jim O'Connor very politely gets up and um, goes to um, the, the the fuse box um, Amanda of course shows her concern and she says don't bump into something you know it's dark and uh, Jim laughs and uh, he says where's the fuse box so um, Amanda shows him the fuse box and uh, Jim starts to examine uh, the fuse box meanwhile of course Amanda keeps on with the chatter keeps on with the small talk uh, and she says you know we live in such a mysterious universe and what was Benjamin Franklin thinking of when he came up with the idea of electricity uh, and blah 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 so non-stop she's talking non-stop meanwhile Jim takes a look at the fuse box and he says the fuse box appears to me to be okay and so Amanda says Tom that electricity bill I gave you several days ago did you submit that did you deposit the money for that and Tom says oh yes and here is where he is telling a lie and he says yes you gave it to me and Amanda says did you pay the bill and Tom says why I and Amanda says I know you didn't I I might have known this and Jim intervenes and he says you know chances are that Shakespeare wrote a poem on that uh, electricity bill and he's of course referring very lightly to um, the fact that uh, that is what 
Tom does. He uh, is not practical. He's not pragmatic. And so when Amanda gives him a bill to deposit, he doesn't do it. Now you and I know that Tom, instead of depositing the light bill or the electricity bill, went and got his membership renewed. He used the money that his mother had given him for something totally different. You and I know it because Tom has confessed it to Jim. Jim O'Connor knows it and Tom knows it. But neither Amanda nor Laura know anything about it. So um, when she asks him, he sort of dilly-dallies and she says, I told you to um, deposit that bill. And um, then she goes on and she says, you know, he's not to be trusted, etc., etc. Now Jim tries to cover up that point because Jim is aware of the reality. He's aware of the fact that instead of um, depositing the bill, Tom has gone and deposited his membership fee. And so um, Amanda starts, um, you know, small talk and she says, you know, we have come into the 20th century, but we'll have to go back to the 19th century because there's no electricity and we'll pretend as if uh, Mr. Edison has not uh, come up with the, the electric light bulb. And Jim says, that's not a problem for me. I like candlelight. Now he's trying to be very polite and courteous to uh, Mrs. Wingfield because he doesn't realize the dark purpose, the ulterior motive behind this invitation to dinner. Um, and uh, when, when he says that I like candlelight, Amanda says, oh, you're such a romantic. Well, anyway, we, we have finished dinner. Uh, and it's very considerate of the um, electricity supply people to have allowed us to finish our dinner in the light and now we can uh, go and sit in um, the, the, the living room. We have plenty of light, there's the moon shining and there's candles and we don't really need um, the light bulbs. And uh, Amanda says, uh, that she would like to have Tom help her with the dishes. What she's maneuvering is that Jim O'Connor gets to spend time with Laura Wingfield. Laura is lying on the sofa because she's not feeling well. Uh, and she gets Jim O'Connor to sit with her and she calls Tom Wingfield out of the room so that she, uh, so that the two uh, young people can have a chance to talk and maybe um, Laura will impress uh, Jim O'Connor to the extent where he asks her to marry him. So she is giving these um, two people an opportunity, not realizing what Jim has in mind. And of course she says that uh, for Tom, the penalty of not paying the light bill is that he gets to clear the dishes. And of course, Jim uh, at once volunteers and says, let me give you a hand. And Amanda says, no, 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 no. You go and sit there. Uh, you go and uh, entertain uh, Laura. And we too will uh, help to clean up. And um, Jim, of course, feels a little embarrassed. Uh, because um, he is also a young man, he's strong and he would like to help. Uh, but Amanda says, um, you know, um, Laura is feeling very lonesome and I want you to give her company. Uh, and uh, we'll manage, you know, we don't have a problem. We do this all the time. But it's Laura that I'm concerned about because Laura is lonesome and I want you to go and sit with her and entertain her um, and in short, um, give her company. So, um, you know, Jim agrees to do that and uh, then Amanda takes this one step further and uh, she says, you know, could you uh, convince Laura to have a little wine? Because it would be good for her. It would improve her health. Um, and you see how she's maneuvering everything. She's putting the two young people together and giving them the maximum opportunity to get to know each other. 
and to come into a relationship and at the same time she removes herself and she removes Tom Wingfield from Jim O'Connor's presence so that whatever um, Jim has to say Laura will be the only one who will hear it so um, she she is an expert um, at maneuvering and this is how uh, she does it so Amanda and um, Tom go out and uh, Laura is very nervous when he enters she sits up at once and she's very tense uh, and she um, she cannot speak uh, loudly her speech is very low um, Jim has um, difficulty in understanding her and um, the legend right now on the screen is I don't suppose you remember me at all and this is the background to the meeting between Laura and Jim because Laura remembers Jim but Jim does not recall Laura or at least he has not recognized her until this point in time um, Jim of course is his normal friendly self but Laura re reads a lot into this friendliness and she thinks that he is giving her uh, preferential treatment until she finds out um, the secret uh, in Jim O'Connor's life so Jim starts off the conversation as he would with a totally new individual with somebody he's meeting for the first time and says hello there Laura and Laura can just barely ma manage a hello so he asks her how she's feeling and um, you know she, her voice is very low and she's very shy and very very tense and um, Jim brings her a glass of dandelion wine wine which is supposed to be very very mild you know not the intoxicating kind not the kind that makes you uh, go around weaving and um, and not at all in control of your uh, senses so she takes the glass of dandelion wine um, and Jim says drink it but don't get drunk you know he's trying to make light of this situation trying to make her feel good because um, she is very serious and he thinks that she's not feeling well so um, he shows his sympathy towards her and he says okay you can have this wine drink it but do not get drunk and and he laughs at his own joke Laura of course doesn't uh, laugh at all because she's thoroughly uh, nervous and she's very very tense um, and Jim says you know where shall I sit uh, and Laura says well anywhere and Jim says well maybe I'll sit on the floor do you have any objections and Laura says no now that's not uh, now that's not usual gentlemen who are uh, out on a social visit do not go and sit on the floor of the living room but that's where Jim feels comfortable and Laura is so tense and she's so nervous and she's so panic stricken that you know she says you can sit anywhere and I don't mind if you sit on the floor if she had been in her senses she wouldn't have allowed him um, to sit on the floor uh, but Jim does that and he says you know I'll spread a newspaper under me to catch um, the, um, the, the, the the drippings of the candle so he sets the candle on the floor and um, he is trying to sort of uh, make this into a very cozy place and he's trying to make Laura feel comfortable so that she is not tense um, and um, she's not nervous all the time so he puts the candle on the floor and he spreads a newspaper under it so that the wax that's falling from the top of the candle will fall on the newspaper and not on the floor uh, which uh, Amanda Wingfield has polished um, and, and she spent the whole day doing that so um, he sits on the floor and then he says don't you like sitting on the floor and um, Laura you know out of courtesy has to sit with him on the on the floor and he gives her a cushion 
and so you know makes the whole place very cozy with um, the candle uh, on the floor with Laura and Jim sitting on the floor it's far cozier than it would be if they were sitting on the sofa side by side or if they were sitting on um, two sofas facing each other so um, Laura says I can see you but Jim says I can't see you I'm in the limelight you can see me but I cannot see you and so he moves um, the candle a little and then he says now I can see you uh, and and then he asks whether Laura is comfortable and uh, Laura says yes so Jim says I'm as comfortable as a cow so slightly crude references um, he makes not really uh, as refined as um, for example Mrs. Wingfield's speech or for that matter as refined as Laura's speech so he takes out a stick of gum and he says uh, do you want to have some and Laura says no thank you um, and so um, Jim starts chewing gum again it is uh, it is very casual on his part uh, because you don't chew gum in company it's supposed to be rude it's supposed to be insulting so um, he starts off with conversation that arises out of the topic of chewing gum and he talks about the Wrigley building uh, and he says you know that's uh, one of the most important sites of Chicago uh, and what he's trying to, s to do is to make her feel comfortable so that she will not be nervous uh, and tense and so he asks her if he has um, if she has visited any of the cities and he, she says no uh, and uh, he asks about one particular exhibition and she says no I've never been there and so Jim says oh you know it was a wonderful uh, exposition and what impressed me most of all was the Hall of Science and so you know he comes out with these ideas and um, with places and uh, people that Laura has never met places that Laura has never seen and that she is not likely to see so he is trying to make her feel comfortable but he is also um, trying to assert his superiority over that of um, Laura and then he says your brother tells me that you shy uh, and and what's the reason and Laura says I don't know so uh, Jim you know at once gives his decision he's full of self-confidence and he says I judge you as an old-fashioned type I think that's a pretty good type to be but you are old-fashioned and then he says I hope you don't mind what I've said and of course Laura doesn't mind anything that he says for Laura he is still the high school hero for Laura he is still the recipient of all her love and affections so in her eyes he can do no wrong and that is why um, she allows him to do whatever he wants to she allows him to say whatever he wants to and when he asks her to sit on the floor um, it's not a very uh, unusual uh, demand coming from Jim O'Connor so she is willing to do anything that he tells her to now this is the point at which we're going to stop here we're coming close to the end of the play uh, but the time has sort of run out for today so let me quickly recap um, what we have done today we started off um, today's lecture at a point where Jim O'Connor and Tom Wingfield have just entered um, the Wingfield apartment and they are conversing about their situation uh, in the warehouse and Jim O'Connor um, tells Tom that if he is not careful and if he spends a lot of time reading and writing poetry very soon he is going to be kicked out of the company uh, but Tom is not worried about that and he says uh, before they kick me out 
I am going to leave because I am um, a member of um, the Merchant um, Seamen Society and I intend to go sailing. I intend to go out on a ship and not come back. Um, he tells this to Jim and uh, Jim is worried because he says, you know, if you go, what is to become of your mother? He doesn't um, realize uh, the situation of Tom's sister, so he doesn't mention her, but he does mention the mother and he says, you know, what is going to become of your mother? And um, Tom points to the portrait on the wall and he says, do you see him? This was my father. He ran away 16 years ago, 16 years after him. I am going to run away and I am going to um, make sure that I have a life of adventure. I have a life of excitement because I'm sick to death of watching movies and seeing people lead very exciting and very adventurous lives. I want to go out and experience adventure for myself. And um, then he tells, uh, or rather he confides in Jim, and he says that, um, you know, um, what I have done is that instead of paying the electricity bill, I have gone and renewed my membership uh, with the Society of Merchant Seamen. And very soon, I'm going to go away. I don't care where I go, but it's going to be a place where there are no shoes except on the feet of the traveler. I don't want to have anything to do with shoes. I don't want my life to have shoes in it the way it has right now. Now, during this conversation, Amanda comes in and uh, because she wants to have some time alone with Jim O'Connor, she sends Tom to the kitchen to find out if supper is ready. Now that serves a twofold purpose. One, she has Jim O'Connor to herself and she can ask him the questions that she wants to. And the other is she gives um, Jim O'Connor the impression that um, Laura has done all the work because you know she's trying to present her as a very uh, Sugar Siani uh, woman of the house because she's presenting him as a prospective wife. So she says, you know, Laura has done all the work and Laura has done all the cooking, although it's Mrs. Wingfield who's done everything. Laura has not done anything at all. Laura doesn't do anything. So um, she tries to um, convey this impression and very soon Tom comes back and he says, you know, uh, supper is on the table. So then uh, Mrs. Wingfield calls out to Laura and Laura says that I'm not feeling well and therefore I'll be unable to join you for supper. Mrs. Wingfield gets very angry and she says, you come here right now because we are not starting without you. So then Laura comes in but she stumbles a little and um, she is told to go and sit in the living room or lie down in the living room uh, and not have to sit at the table. So Laura is very happy that she is banished from the dining room and she's told to go and lie down on the sofa. So she does do that. Meanwhile, what Mrs. Wingfield does is that um, she maneuvers the conversation in such a way that she has uh, Jim O'Connor's total attention, total and exclusive attention. Meanwhile, um, they eat and just when they finish with their uh, meal, the lights go out. Now there is a little light coming in because of um, the moon, but that's not enough. So Mrs. Wingfield quickly lights the candles and she says, you know, uh, it's lucky that we have these candles right here on the table. Um, and um, she thinks that a fuse has blown. And so she asks uh, Jim O'Connor if he can do anything and he says, okay, uh, just show me where the fuse boxes are. So he goes and he examines the fuse box and he says, all the fuses are uh, working properly. And this is the point at which Mrs. Wingfield interferes and um, she, uh, she says that neither 
she nor Tom Wingfield know the first thing about fuse boxes. So could Mr. O'Connor take a look at it? Jim O'Connor takes a look at it and he sees that all the fuses are intact. He knows that the light has gone because Tom Wingfield has not paid the electricity bill. So Mrs. Wingfield um, sort of uh, gets him to admit that um, he has not uh, paid the bill. And um, when he admits it, she says, your penalty is that you will help me to clear up the dishes. Jim volunteers, but uh, Amanda says, no, you go and sit with Laura because she wants to give Laura and Jim some time to get to know each other without there being anyone else in their presence. So um, you see that that sort of succeeds to the extent that Jim is able to make Laura feel at ease, feel comfortable. Uh, and so he puts the candle on the floor. He also sits on the floor and he asks Laura to join him on the floor. So a very nice cozy atmosphere is the point at which I'm going to leave you today. Hopefully in the next two classes we'll be able to complete the rest of the play. So uh, you've been a very patient audience uh, and I hope that you are learning something from this module. So uh, thank you for being patient and for today, Allah Hafiz.